is an initiative that we've been working on for uh, over a year now. Uh, and it's a multifaceted initiative aimed at engaging women in Australia to support refugee women through raising funds, sharing skills, and opening up our networks, both here in Australia and globally. Uh, refugee women, and I've had the pleasure, I guess, and privilege, I should say, over 20 years of working with Australia for UNHCR, of meeting many amazing women. Um, and I think it's absolutely wrong to think of, of refugee women and girls as victims. Uh, inevitably, they're survivors, they're strong, they're resilient. But by the very na nature of being displaced, uh, they, they face uh, double discrimination and disadvantage. Um, and it's our mission at Australia for UNHCR to mobilise the resources to enable these women to live more financially secure and most importantly, safe lives. And we know that what is good for women is also good for the community. Goal five of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is to achieve gender um, equality, which as the UN states, is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. However, we also know uh, we still have a long way to go on this. And as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres described, um, it's gender um, equity is the unfinished business of our time. Displacement has always been a gendered issue. Four out of five refugees are women and children. My hope for the Leading Women Fund is that we can create a community of women working together for gender equality. And I'm so glad to see so many um, women joining us today for the launch of what we genuinely believe will be a life-changing experience. We are calling today for you to step up and become one of our founding 50 members uh, of the Leading Women's Fund. The first priority of the, the fund will be to support refugee women in Jordan. Jordan is currently home to 650,000 Syrian refugees and other refugees fleeing civil war. One third of the refugee households are headed by women. As part of this initiative, the founding 50 members will trial and help um, co-create the new Connecting World app, which we're going to talk about with our uh, speakers later on. Uh, the app is indeed, I would say, uh, an Australia first. Um, and uh, we've often, um, through, with our supporters and, and our connections, how do we actually connect with the, the people that, that, that we do support? Uh, and this is a really innovative and, and a unique way to, to achieve that. We are asking members of the Founding 50 to commit $250 a month or $3,000 over the course of uh, a year, which is enough to support a refugee woman and her family for a year. That would cover her rent, uh, utilities, uh, food and school fees. Enough to keep uh, food on the table and her children safe and in school. So to hear more about what this means on the ground, I want to introduce uh, Carolyn Ennis, the Deputy Representative of UNHCR in our, our Jordan mission, who is joining us from Jordan's capital, Amman, today. Welcome, Carolyn. Carolyn, I, can you hear me? Yes, now I'm unmuted. Good morning and thank you. It's <laughs> such an honour to, to join this, this amazing group this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, a, as we discussed before, I, I visited uh, Jordan in the very early days of the Syrian crisis in, back in 2013. Uh, and uh, Zatri camp, which was well established, um, uh, but still people living in um, uh, containers and, and, you know, very difficult circumstances for people there. And the site for Azraq uh, refugee camp was just starting to be excavated. Um, at, the at that time, you know, I spoke to so many people and they were still optimistic that the crisis would be over, that they would be able to return to their home and, and, and families back in Syria. But clearly for so many that hasn't happened. Seven years on, Carolyn, could you talk about just generally the situation in, in Jordan at the moment uh, and then we'll come to the specific situation of uh, refugee women? Well, 
Jordan has been tremendously impacted first by the Iraqi influx and then by the Syrian influx. And Jordan itself is really struggling to cope with the impact of its own economic situation, needs for education, employment for its own population. And UNHCR and the UN as a whole are really advocating for support to Jordan and from our perspective, you know, a safe, prosperous Jordan provides better protection space for everyone. And access to livelihoods is key. And the reason I'm talking about Jordan and its population and the host community is that social cohesion is so important. The Jordanians continue to be welcoming hosts to refugees, but they really depend on help from the international community. How it's changed is that things are very systematized, but the needs remain. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, and I think we have some photos, if we could put those up, um, because most of us uh, won't have seen this. Uh, Carolyn, if you can see that, I, I think that might be um, Azraq. Yes, Azraq was um, designed using all the lessons learned from Zatari, which has continued to be somehow more organic and lively. Um, Azraq was much, much more, uh, we had time to design it in a more systematic way so that, you know, caravans are laid out in fairly orderly rows, which doesn't really show in the picture. Um, but UNHCR really encourages refugee resilience and self-reliance. Less than 18% of all the refugees in Jordan live in camps. But I was talking to the government recently about the future of camps, and they said, we agree with you. Camps are not ideal, but we absolutely depend on UNHCR and the international community to have this safety net. As a safety net, the camps have really developed and we have schools, activities, programs, Taekwondo, um, the Tiger Girls. We have a lot of programs that help refugees and more refugee women in camps have regular employment than those outside camps because the camp provides um, accommodation and a safe place to leave their children so that they can go out to work. So the camps really provide a lot. They're getting better all the time, they're expensive. Um, they're better systematized, but the vision in the long term is, of course, durable solutions and self-reliance. Thank you. And with um, the situation of, of, of refugee women out of, out of the population of refugees in, in, in Jordan, how, can you tell me how many are women and girls? Um, and then I'd just like to talk about their situation and, and particular challenges that they have. Well, over half... Um, let's see, 46.8% of our population are children. And, um, sorry, I, if I can't leave the screen to get the exact number of females, but <laughs> over half the population are female, with a third of them female-headed households. The situation of women has been exacerbated by COVID because of the lockdown. And this is illustrated because the top requests have been for cash assistance and for protection and response to gender-based violence. During the lockdown, our mobility has been reduced, but we had staff living inside the camps even during the lockdown. So we've never lost touch with the community via phone, WhatsApp trees, refugee community associations that we're in touch with on a daily basis. There was a desperate need for cash, for food, and other basic costs of living. Requests for help with gender-based violence have reached the same level as requests for cash assistance. So cash is our best way to protect women, girls, and children, and men. But the majority are women and girls, um, people who are at risk of and have faced gender-based violence. And I should note here that the family protection department in the government, in the Ministry of Social Assistance, uh, social development has been a very active partner so we've had access to to courts to police protection i think the community-based associations unhcr staff refugees have really done an amazing job however if we don't have the cash for these families it's very very difficult to provide meaningful assistance of, of any kind mm -hmm. 
And that there's other examples of livelihood, and, and I think we have some some photos of, of, of those because that's been a key focus of the UNHCR. If you move on from that, I want to come back to that one because that's specifically about cash assistance. But if we could go to the other photos. Um, yep. I can see those. I think keep going, please. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess some of these income generating um, projects, that would be typical also of many of the projects that I've seen in, 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 in the field, um, tailoring, sewing, baking, cooking. Uh, 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 they, um, just some of the, the kinds of support that UNHCR is providing to, to, to women in um, Jordan. We're trying to go beyond their traditional um, livelihoods with sewing machines um, and targeting everyone. I've spoken to women in their 30s who said, we want to learn coding too. Um, we have a lot of traditional livelihoods. Uh, we're really making progress on getting permission for home-based businesses, which involves you know, soap making, jewelry making, but there's also code coding. There's robotics, which is amazing. Um, women have been trained as plumbers. Huh. And yeah, so this is something which can be done to raise, to make money both in Jordan and on return to their home companies. A lot of home countries, a lot of women really don't like a male coming in to fix their plumbing. And now we have a cadre of women plumbers. Um, and then hydroponics. We have, we're trying to just be a little bit more innovative and imaginative. And again, uh, trying to ensure that we can target the host community, agriculture, animal husbandry, um, techniques in agriculture, advanced techniques in agriculture, and things that bring local people and refugees together. These are all areas that we're looking at because obviously economic self-reliance is the key to protection from a whole range of exploitative treatments and, and mistreatment. And, and I imagine some of those um, new areas such as plumbing and um, robotics and whatever, yes. Um, if you're skilled in those, you're going to earn more than you are in traditional areas as a woman, such as tailoring or baking or, or, or those other areas. Yeah. We're trying to move away from gender stereotyping while respecting um, what people are comfortable with. So, you know, for the women who like making pickles at home, and can make money, that is great. But for the women who are ready to, you know, do something a little bit unconventional perhaps for their for their traditional society, you know, we're trying to build on these options as well. Yes, yes. Now, if I was a, a young girl right now in, in Jordan um, uh, a, a, as a refugee, what would be my prospects, Carolyn? Well, you would be struggling to access education. You would hope to get a tablet and internet access. And if you could do that and have a television set that you didn't have to share with too many siblings, you could actually follow your education. And we've had refugees successfully take their exams after studying online. We've also got uh, refugee students who've gone through universities uh, sponsored by various international programs. And now we have bright young graduates in law, medicine, engineering, um, who are all ready to move on, but they're a bit limited right now because they're not allowed to work in Jordan. So we have some huge success stories. We have a young refugee woman whose name I won't give, but she's uh, become a very well-known paint painter. So we have regular painting exhibits, handicrafts exhibits, and a whole range of different activities. So if you're a young woman, you can learn karate, taekwondo, and coding. You can join different groups, you can go to the community centers, you can study, you can go to school, but you're gonna be worried at home. Dad's perhaps not there or making money. Mum's worried because there's not enough money. She can't support the family by selling the cheese that she makes. You're worried about your brothers and sisters. Prices are going up. People haven't been able to access the informal market. Prior to COVID, most of our refugees had some sort of informal employment, which wasn't ideal, but it, it provided a certain amount of resilience. 
now we're working closely with WFP and other partners to try to get assistance to people in urban areas and in camps. And you showed a picture of the um, cash machine. That's people who registered with their irises, which yes. I think this is important for people to know. Um, our common cash facility is a common facility, which means that the bank rates are around 1% or less. That means that the money that goes through that system really goes to the beneficiaries and it can't be cheated because you can't fake your iris when you're going to the ATM. So this is the crucial protection tool that we have for the most vulnerable families. We've massively increased our urgent cash assistance and we've extended our regular cash based interventions due to COVID. And that if you were a young girl would be your biggest concern. Can I get to the ATM? Is my family eligible for assistance? Is the money going to come this, this month or not? Mm -hmm. Karen, you, you mentioned that, that photo and we might bring it back in a, in a minute, but if you could explain it in a bit more detail about the, the value of the cash assistance program, because I know when I talk to a lot of people, it's, well, why would you trust giving cash out? You know, isn't it safer to give, you know, some goods in kind, rations, whatever. And it's actually, I think, cash assistance has really transformed the way that we think about humanitarian assistance and, and people's lives. Um, but in a practical sense, could you explain actually how it works, how you sign up, how you receive it and, and um, yeah, uh, the, the process around that? Thank you. It's all about dignity. We are not the, the benefactors giving the grateful beneficiaries plastic buckets that they don't want. We're talking about how we can empower people with refugee status. Now you sign up when you're registered by UNHCR on behalf of the government. Once you're registered, all your data goes into our database and we have a highly developed vulnerability assessment framework to try to find the people who are absolutely the most vulnerable of the already vulnerable. That means there's nobody of working age in the family, people with handicaps, single female headed households with only small children. So this is the core group that we assist and all of the agencies, NGOs can book families through our refugee um, assistance information system so that we can assure that there's no duplication. If you want to assist 10 female headed households, you book them on RIAS. The money goes through the common cash facility from your account straight to the refugee. And because it's based on the IRIS, which we register when people are um, approach UNHCR, we know who the money is going to. And if I can digress a tiny bit, I've worked with refugees since the 80s. And I've been there when we've been handing out plastic buckets, which people have then gone to sell in the market at a loss so that they can buy whatever it is that they need. We give families the money that they need so that they can prioritize. Women tend to prioritize a little bit better. However, especially in, in this context, we found that we haven't had this, this gender issue. Um, females have managed their budgets well. There's been some indication they've managed a little bit better than men, but we don't have an issue of the male head of household taking the money and not, not sharing it, which is not the case in every environment. But it's all about dignity. You get the money, you decide what you need and where you spend the money. And that's really, it gives a great deal more dignity and it takes away this sense of, you know, I'm a grateful beneficiary and I'm going to thank you for the, for the beans in the plastic bucket that I don't really want or need. Yes, yes. Can we have that photo um, again? I, I love it though of the the woman going um, to get her cash out, um, and it shows what Caroline was talking about with the um, uh, iris rec recognition. Lee, I'm not sure we could get that up. Uh, when, when you get it up, please um, do, Caroline. We'll, we'll continue um, talking for a, a, a moment. Are there any specific examples, and, and you've given like some great examples generally, but um, uh, specific examples of um, how cash assistance has improved the well-being of women? Well, it allows women in vulnerable households to prioritise their needs, to pay their rent, pay their electricity, 
and make sure that I think the biggest way that it really helps them if they can't pay their rent they're in a tremendously vulnerable position they risk being exploited by landlords or by people they've borrowed money from and that puts a woman at particular risk that means that they can get self safe shelter they can get the hygiene products that they need and we don't just say okay you get a lump sum we add money in for health if you have a health need for additional particular special needs that people have and if I can expand on this a little bit um, we also have this health outreach so that for the most vulnerable we actually work with partners and the government mainly with partners to deliver medicines to people's homes if they can't get out but for a woman not to be able to pay her rent or feed her children having that cash in hand really empowers her to say no to exploitation yes and, and this isn't just women i mean this is young men this is everyone who's potentially vulnerable when it's like do what i want or i'm going to throw you out into the street that cash in hand is a real shield yes yes and carolyn i've just got a great um comment from um one of the the women joining us to today lynn who says with parents and siblings who have lived in refugee camps in thailand and indonesia in the in the 80s i can testify that the work done by uh, the un is very important having access to food and water supplies as well as access to skills training in these camps is so important how fantastic that women are being trained as plumbers such a practical skill <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, wonderful comment and, and, and thank you, Lynn. Uh, thanks, Caroline. I'm, I, I'm going to come back to you, um, but I would just like to, to come to um, Zoe. Um, and um, I've known Zoe Ghani, who's our board member for, for, for many years. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say, Zoe, um, uh, you know, you come, uh, I think people's um, stereotypes about who a refugee is um, are often very wrong. Uh, that's about refugees in Jordan as, as, as well as here. Uh, Zoe was forced to flee Afghanistan with her family when she was in primary school, uh, eventually being resettled in um, Western Sydney. When I first met Zoe. Um, you'll remember Zoe, you were just a young student at university uh, and I have to say already such a uh, remarkable person. Um, you're a poet, a writer and then a fashion designer uh, and an all-round renaissance woman. Um, you've gone on to have an impressive career in media and technology including as chief technology officer at online fashion retailer The Iconic. Um, which I think my daughter has been subsidising <laughs> in, a, in a large part and perhaps many of the um, uh, uh, our friends here today. And uh, you were recently appointed and c c congratulations on that as Head of Product at Software Multinational um, Atlassian. Uh, Zoe, I'm not seeing you on my screen, so I'm, I'm hoping you are there. I, um, I am here. And I can thank you, me. very good. I'm going to start off. Can you talk about your your journey um, from Afghanistan uh, to Australia as a young child? Sure. Um, it was 1982 when my family decided to flee. I was five years old. Uh, my father was a public prosecutor and this was during the Soviet invasion. And um, he didn't join the Communist Party. Obviously, he didn't believe in, in those values. And um, I remember being in a state of war, have couple of memories here and there as a child and um, obviously my family didn't feel very safe. I think I went to school uh, half a day and um, had a few bad things happen around us and uh, my parents had three kids including myself and my mum was pregnant and uh, my father kind of applied for and received a law scholarship and it was meant to be that we leave the country for a year. Obviously they didn't intend to come back because it was never going to be safe without all the wars there. Uh, we settled in uh, New Delhi for four years. I went to school there, fell in love with the city and the people and the friends and the language and the cuisine. Uh, but it wasn't appropriate for us to stay there uh, as refugees for the long term. And so my family applied for refugee status to lots of different countries. So I could have been in Canada or the US and uh, luckily settled in Sydney. 
and uh, arrived here when I was nine and uh, have called Australia home ever since then. I'm deeply blessed um, to be able to do that, to call Australia home. That is not true for 80 million people who are displaced um, right now. So yeah, that's kind of the story in a nutshell. Yeah, and and last year you travelled with myself and um, a small group of, of very dynamic women uh, to Uganda and that was our very first immersion trip for the Le Leading Women Fund. Um, can you just um, share with everyone here what that trip was about and your experience on that? Sure, I, I would say I'd probably describe it as a rich tapestry of different experiences and three things um, stood out. Um, actually, there's four things. The fourth thing is I became a selfie obsessed person, as you can see here, and um, started taking selfies and I'm not usually a selfie person. Um, but there's pr probably three key themes, I would say. The first one was around the opportunity to meet uh, refugee women. Um, mainly one of the groups is this one, which was the Refugee Women's Craft Group in Kampala. And uh, we got to meet them one-on-one -on -one, um, to have conversations, but also um, running workshops jointly with them. And um, it was, uh, I guess, a story of resilience and generosity because um, we got to see these women who were refugees themselves creating opportunities for other refugee women um, to live self-reliant lives. And uh, I learned from their resourcefulness and resilience. And I, it was exciting to see what really happens when women stand with other women. The second piece is really around the impact. So uh, we also visited the Vocational Education Centre and um, got to go and see the impact of Australian donors on refugee lives. And the Vocational Centre had different classrooms where uh, people would uh, be able to now get an education in different um, and training in different fields. And we got to speak to the students. We also actually went to a school. This is uh, us doing a class. Um, <laughs> Or about all things Australiana. Kids trying Vegemite, uh, some of them did not like the taste, I'm with them. Um, and then I guess the third piece really was around uh, personal uh, reflection. I think leadership's a lot about self-awareness and learning from others. And personally, I learned from this group of women who we went with a lot, um, got getting to share ideas and experiences and also from the women who we met there as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's kind of, these are kind of three broad themes that I would say have stayed with me till today. And, and I must say to, to everybody here, we were hoping, of course, to have our second um, Leading Women Fund um, trip to Uganda, uh, but circumstances this year have prevented it. But uh, it's certainly uh, something that will be part of this uh, initiative on an ongoing basis. Um, and I know uh, our friends in the uh, Refugee Women's Craft Group in Kampala are just waiting and, and excited about us uh, returning because I think one of the important things we all learned from that, those women who I've worked with uh, in Kampala for a number of years, um, are really amazing. When I first met a number of them, they were sleeping in the street, um, you know, very difficult circumstances through our, our craft livelihood project. Um, they've been able to move into better accommodation, um, send their kids to school, set up small businesses. Uh, and when we had this trip, you know, I was, I wasn't sure, but I was really, um, I wanted to be a two way thing. Uh, and I think as Caroline clearly has said, the way of a one way exchange is, is over. But it was really interesting. They had so much to teach us, but they also love being part of the leadership program that, 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 that we were part of. Um, uh, and so, um, fingers crossed. 2021, we'll, we'll, we'll all be out of our um, bedrooms <laughs> or, or wherever we are right right now, a bit further afield. So you've been, because of your, your tech background and you are on the board of Australia, but, you know, uh, for UNHCR, you've been very involved in uh, helping develop this app and I wanted you to talk about that. Um, indeed, you probably know far more about it than I do, so... 
please share. Um, it's been a really rewarding experience to be able to bring some of my tech insights into this field and to work on the app. And um, so I got the fortune to be part of the very start of the journey where we, um, you know, the team talked to the women, to Australian women, um, and to understand how they wanted to be involved and how they wanted to connect and how they wanted to support um, refugees. And in, within that, what was important to them. And this feedback, um, you know, went into creating the app, which is about all about connection. Um, and I um, then became one of the very early users of the app and I was matched up with a young lady in Jordan who had two kids, was a house, um, head of her own household. Um, and we connected and bonded through recipes. I like trying new ingredients and um, so did she. And we kind of went on this uh, exchange of, I guess, uh, recipe ideas and um, connection over food, which we both like to um, to explore. And so um, through that kind of being an early alpha user of it, I was able to provide feedback to the team around user experience, you know, what the emotional journey is like to connect with someone and how might we improve the experience for others um, who will use it. And um, I think the app itself is an amazing way for us to connect with other women. I felt like it was a pen pal 2.0, um, uh, a, uh, you know, in that the, the connections can become very deep and um, the information exchange is much faster than you would have in a pen pal setting, but it was really good opportunity to spend time one-on-one -on -one and, um, you know, improve the, the experience for other women um, who will use it after us. Okay, thank you. I'm going to come back again um, a, a bit later, but I'd just like to go to uh, Janine Ellis now. Um, and Janine is well known, I'm sure, to everybody here, um, uh, not only as the uh, iconic Boost Juice uh, business founder, entrepreneur, uh, businesswoman, um, but survivor of Survivor. <laughs> And um, well, we could talk about that, I'm sure. We, we, we haven't talked about your experiences on Survivor or Shark Tank in, in, in depth, uh, Janine, but um, we'll have the opportunity one day, I'm sure. Um, but I just wanted to start because you are amazing and you, you sort of uh, obviously overcome all sorts of challenges, but I don't know whether it's true to say um, you've never taken a, a, a backward step. But what, what has driven you in your um, career and, and initiatives um, overall? Look, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think I'm um, ridiculously competitive for a start. <laughs> so everything I want to do, I want to make sure I do it well and become first. <laughs> I think um, the other thing is, you know, you look at um, whether it's a refugee women or whether it's, you know, these people on the, on the panel, I think what a lot of them have in common, the ones that, you know, truly do succeed when others fail is, is true grit. And I really don't think it matters if you've come from money or you've come from, um, you know, some of the challenges that that um, some of these refugees have. It's extraordinary to see how, despite some of the challenges, how people shine. I mean, I had a mentoring session with this gorgeous lady called Yari, who was a, you know was part of the you know UNHCR program and has come to Australia and she's got this ripper little business called the Auntie Ginger Tonic. And she's in, you know, she's in, she's in supermarkets. She's just doing great guns. And, you know, it's what I think people get um, misunderstand with regard to refugees is they think it's them. They don't see that, say that as, oh, you know, that they're obviously into, into cooking and they're into, you know, sewing. And, but I think to Caroline's point, they're into law, they're into medicine, they're into plumbing, they're into art. They're, they've got the same desires and the same dreams that we all have. They've just been given a pretty bad, a really more difficult hand. Doesn't mean with that hand that they've got, they can't succeed. It's just, they just need a little bit more help to get there. And I think that we've got to go, it's we you look at ourselves and we are so lucky to be born in Australia and you go we could have easily just been unlucky enough to be put into a situation that we didn't have the opportunities that we happen to happen to have here and I do think that you know right now on Instagram I don't know if you've noticed it there's a whole lot of black and white photos of women going around and it's all about support women supporting women 
and I'm a firm believer that whether that woman is a girlfriend up the road who needs a bit of a pat because of the current crisis or a woman in, in Jordan who really cannot even um, see that there was a future for her children because of the challenges that they've got. But what I've come across is some of the women that I've spoken to on the app, which is extraordinary, is that they're, they're, they're the same as us. They're no different to us. They have the same fears. They have the same desires. They have the same needs for their children. It's just that they've just been put in a very, very difficult situation. And what I love about the app is that it's also a, um, it's also real time. And so you're actually, it is that pen pal type things that Zoe put in, but you're actually directly speaking to one person about their chat, like you're having a chat with a girlfriend. Like it's it's extraordinary. You send photos, you send recipes, you you talk about their kids, you talk, you laugh, you have jokes. It's and so it does become a human interaction. And the other thing is it's a world first. Yeah, no one else has done it. And I actually don't think that anyone other than a whole great, great group of dynamic women could probably could put it together. You know, I think what women are extraordinary at is we're extraordinary at connecting. And we don't want to just be connected on, on a, a level of, you know, here's a letter, here's a couple of pictures of my children. We do want to actually go, what can I learn from this, this gorgeous woman in another country that has you know, various challenges but still has so much to offer? And so to be part of the Leading Women's Fund and this World First initiative is actually really exciting. And I think that the most important thing is that we, we actually... Um, teach ourselves and our fellow, fellow friends and women is that they are just women which is so not what you asked me Naomi but <laughs> <laughs> and I went on friends <laughs> but um yeah that's where I said I think it was just following you know Zoe and Caroline's you know when you sort of sit and think you go oh my god you know the, these women are incredible musicians and they're artists and they're they're homemakers and they're just beautiful women who just want what we want, which is freedom, um, purpose, uh, respect, and a future for our family. And and what I want you to talk about too is is that sort of the, the practical, you know, how it actually worked with you. Um, because I know people thinking of um, joining up, what does it actually involve? Was it like every day or, you know, was it, no, did you feel it was, a big obligation? Or, yeah. First and foremost, it was very intuitive. So it was actually a really simple thing to, to operate. You know, if you can sort of work um, any sort of, you know, messaging, it's it's pretty easy to work. Um, so yeah, no, it was good. easy. Yeah, no, that was a big tick. Um, so it, did, it didn't really involve, you know, much complexity. Um, the, um, but, you know, it, it depends on the individual. Some days, some people are, are very instant and you, in every couple of days you get a response and, and other days it's a couple of days. But, you know, we're all, we all have sort of a lot on and sometimes it's in and out. So, I, so it's not like this obligation of I need to be on there every hour to make sure that I'm responding or watching. It's got notifications and it's got all sorts of, um, you know, basic things that most technology has, but um, but what I love about it, it's it's real, and not only that it's real, you actually instead of just you know donating to a charity and it goes into this big black hole called you know expenses or or charity, it actually you actually see firsthand the difference that you make, and I think that's actually what's really exciting about this program. Mm, thank you, thank you. Um, and, and again, more questions for you uh, a, a bit later. But if I could come back to uh, Carolyn, just about the um, a couple of questions that I've got here. One about the, the actual cash assistance program at, at the moment. Obviously, it's really important, but I think uh, people are asking, what is the, the need? Um, does Is there a waiting list? How does it work that you actually um, get selected to, to go on it? Are there generally enough resources? sure the answer is no but um, if you could share some of that with us yeah we have a basic core of 30 to 32,000 families who are the most vulnerable and we've we have 
like a super duper database with all kinds of poverty and vulnerability indicators. So we've really tried to zero in on the people with the greatest needs. With COVID, our first reaction was everybody needs it, but we don't have enough money. So we went up to 49,000, but we couldn't get enough money. Um, we just got another tiny injection, I think, of enough to cover a a few more families, but we, we never have enough. We try to, we call it graduate people off cash-based assistance. So once there's someone of wage earning age in the family, we try to find training programs. We try to get people into livelihoods programs. Um, but as I said, we have a core group, then we try to go beyond the core group. And then we have urgent cash assistance when just everything has gone wrong and there is no solution except just help them to pay their rent. People go into debt. And this is a huge problem um, because you're really at the mercy of a lot of people once you're in debt. So people will come in with really significant debts, problems. Um, the government has had to prioritize Jordanians. And so rent forgiveness, alimony payments, all of that, that's there for Jordanians, but it's not there for refugees. So the answer is we've tried to find the people who need it the most. We cannot reach everyone. And we also don't want to have people long-term dependent. We don't want this to become something that replaces self-reliance. We want it to be something that supports empowerment. So we try to balance cash with livelihoods and training and keep circulating people into the list, keep circulating people off of the list. But we never get the amount of funds that we ask for. Um, we have, um, okay, so last year we were 58% funded as at the end of the year, 2020 were 32% funded um, mm -hmm. as of this month. So there's never going to be enough for everyone. So mm -hmm. refugees are trying as hard as we are to, mm -hmm. to find ways to support themselves. And I should mention, they get it that donors and people like you are important. When we take groups to visit camps and also our community centers where we have refugees of 52 different nationalities, I often worry about humanitarian tourism. You know, when people come to see the refugees, I don't want them to see the refugees. I want people to meet other people who are refugees. Um, but without exception, when I have quiet chats with the refugees, they say, look, it's great. We need this visibility. We really like it that people are interested in coming to see us and to learn about us. And I think the key thing here is that refugees are people just like us. When I began to work with refugees back in 1984, I was told, I didn't get any training. It's like, these people will come in. Don't forget, it's just your good luck that you're on this side of the desk and they're on the other side of the desk. Mm -hmm. And you might not be able to do anything for them, but when that person leaves, they have to feel that they have been treated like a human being. And I think, you know, the whole dignity is, absolutely key. We cannot do everything, but we have to remember that refugees, they're not other, they're not a problem. They're people just like us with refugee status, if they're lucky, who really, really need, first of all, our respect and our understanding, and then the tools that they need, the cash and the training, so that they can get the things that we want. Shelter, education for their kids, enough money to pay the rent and put food on the table. Thank you. Now, I've just got some questions about the sort of the practicalities and, and a bit follows on from, you know, you've seen the enthusiasm of Janine and Zoe and being involved, you know, on the app on this side. Um, and you've partly responded, I, I guess, or, or explained why um, uh, Syrian refugee women would like to be involved for the same interest and curiosity and sharing and, and going out the world. How are women selected to be part of this? And of course, there's the issue about language. So um, how do people communicate um, if they don't have English as their first language? Well, most of us speak Arabic. I mean, the national staff are Jordanian, so they speak Arabic. A lot of the Carolyn, just, just Sorry, explain, this is the actual app for a ah. community Yep. So I, I just wondered, you know, from UNHCR side, how women were selected to be part of this um, initiative in, in, in Jordan. 
um, and then how issues like language were, were, were managed. Well, the selection is done super carefully um, with people who've got really specific protection sensitivities, we wouldn't include them. Um, like we're very, very careful to look at the profile of the family and then counsel them about it. So we screen a large number of potential applicants and discuss it with them and brief them about it. And they understand that this will not get you individually cash. This will not get you individually resettlement. This contributes to what we are trying to do together with the broader community. So the basic selection would be from our progress database, which is a huge identity management system where when you come to UNHCR, your iris is taken, your personal data is taken, and we have massive, massive data protection um, protocols and systems. And this is the basis for any type of selection. Once we've selected people who are generally eligible, we narrow the list down and finally we'll go to individual discussions and counselling so that people are going in with their eyes open with the expectation that they'll relate to someone outside, they know why they're doing it and they know what, what the outcomes will be and also what the outcomes will not be. Yeah, yes. Because it's... And, and with languages, how, 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 how are we managing that? With languages... As far as I know, we are translating and interpreting online. We have the app is moderated by a wonderful colleague who isn't with us online, Rajan, who's um, also got a fabulously interesting background. And she moderates not just the um, translation of the messages, but also the content. So if things are becoming touchy, political, providing information that could put someone else at risk. We have a lot of ways of just saying, okay, this doesn't quite meet the criteria for this because we really have to keep this on a human level. But remember, refugees are coming from very, very dangerous countries where they've got relatives. Um, and so anything that could get into sensitive areas, we try to just moderate that. So we're not gonna have refugees saying, please send me money directly, please call me. Um, so we, we have moderators. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to me, I think that's one of the exciting things because for years, you know, obviously because of the sensitivities on all sides, you know, this idea of di direct connection was never actually able to be realised. Um, yeah. And I think a huge amount of effort on a number of people's parts, and you've mentioned Rojan being one key person. Yes. And it's a really positive experience for everybody mm. involved and a safe experience for every everybody involved. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but you know, you know, I don't think we can underestimate what's going on in the back end to, 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 yeah. to deliver that. Um, uh, I, I've just had, as somebody has asked, um, whether um, children or um, uh, other members of family could be involved. Does it just have to be a, a, a woman? And I understand as long as um, you're one of the founding 50, uh, and again, I think as Caroline's explained, there is a moderator. It's something you would want to involve your family in, I think, also, possibly, to share just beyond your own experience, uh, but mindful of that responsibility um, uh, uh, around uh, respecting that relationship and, and, and the communication. Um, uh, uh, Zoe, I'm just going to come back to, to you for a moment because one of the, I think, things in our many discussions is you, you mentioned the figure of 80 million displaced people worldwide, which is currently um, uh, what UNHCR estimates is the, is the global situation. And I know, again, when I talk to people, that number is can be overwhelming. But of course, we always talk about, you know, every action counts. Um, and here we're asking, you know, 50 people to take action that, that will count. But so you have a, a, a lovely story I remember from your early days in Australia about a school teacher who actually uh, changed the course of, of your life. Um, could you share that with us? Yeah, um, so I was in year five and um, strange things used to happen where I would uh, burst into tears like um, the teacher asked everybody to sing their national anthem on a particular day at assembly and um, 
this was a very conflicting thing for me because we just arrived to Australia and anything to do with nationality, language, led back to Afghanistan and I would kind of um, break down in tears. And what I was crying at, about at that time was that I don't think I have a national anthem because I like, where, where, what is my country and I've had to leave it and so forth. And so this uh, particular teacher took me under her wing and um, really helped me to um, discover a book that I still think about called Pink, um, Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. And it was about a girl and her family who had to flee um, during Hitler's time and became refugees. And for the first time I understood that I was a refugee and that is what a refugee was. And um, through that book, I understood also that I wasn't alone and that there were, there was, I guess it gave me lang a language with which to kind of understand my own experience a little bit and then to formulate my own understanding of that separate to that at the same time. And I think she um, also introduced me to books and the library and to writing and expressing myself through writing. So I think Naomi, when you talk about, um, you know, every action counts, this is a teacher in a school taking care of, of a kid that seems to be a bit lost. And um, she stayed with me all my life and that has had such a massive impact and has inspired me to think small while I'm thinking big. So that number is very overwhelming, um, but it, it kind of helps me to see, oh wait, so even if we make a difference to one life, create one connection, share learnings in one level, that is still something that is super meaningful um, for people. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and uh, I think Linda, one of our um, uh, women joining us today, has asked whether the app could apply for refugees in our own community. Who knows where we might go with this, but for Australia for UNHCR, our mandate is to support um, UNHCR's work for uh, refugees displaced um, outside of Australia. Um, and having heard the, the figure of 80 million, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big um, challenge. Uh, but certainly I, I think, you know, as, as we go forward, the way we sort of connect, not just um, uh, in other countries, but also in our own communities is, is, is really important. Um, I'm going to come back to um, uh, you, Janine, and... Um, I just want your thoughts sort of along those lines. You're a big ideas person and a thinker. Um, where do you think this project's going to go and, and, and take you personally, but also has the potential if we get our 50 founders to sign up, which I, I'm really hopeful we, we will um, after this launch. Where do you think we can go in, the, in that blue sky? Look, if you think of any... Um any idea starts with a line of, wouldn't it be good if? You know, and so for us, it's, wouldn't it be good if we could create an app that connects donors with the actual source of where they get their money so they can create a meaningful relationship and a meaningful understanding of each other's lives and dreams? And so I think that having this, and what a great vision. I mean, that is the coolest vision. And so really, where can it go? Well, you know what, the, the great thing about technology these days is that you you're actually aren't capped. You know, it's not like you physically need, you know, yes, there's some things that we need with regard to, um, you know, monitoring and translating and all those sort of things, but it's not, you know, if you can create an app that is self-sufficient, then it is endless. And so if we could get millions of women around the world, not just in Australia, but around the world, to connect with other women around the world that really do need some support, and you, you're suddenly really solving problems that are, are, are real problems there for out there. So you sort of go, yeah, we all talked about you've got to start small to look big. And that's true. So if you go one person doing it, that's great. That's, that's great. 50 people, awesome. With those 50 people, we will learn an enormous amount what works and what doesn't work and we'll tweak it. That 50 will go to 1,000. We'll, we'll learn more things. Then it becomes a community. Then it becomes a country. Then suddenly, suddenly we walk down the path a couple of years and we are actually helping millions of women and millions of people. You know, when you say women supporting women, you know, this we have an opportunity by one woman at a time. It's like what I do in business. 
we we serve millions of people every day at Boost Juice Bars, a fruit juice Boost and a juice. But it started with one customer. Our business was built one customer at a time. This app and vision will start with one woman at a time. And you don't have to do anything else other than one step. And I think that's what's exciting. So where can it go, Naomi? It can go anywhere. <laughs> I love it. All right. So thank you so much, Janine. And and thank you to um, Zoe and thank you to, to Carolyn um, all the way from Oman. And we should all be proud of ourselves, as usual, as anyone who's participated in these kind of Zoom webinar panel discussions. The pre-preparation, the 10 minutes before when everything goes a bit wonky <laughs> you can't get in but i'm very pleased we've all done 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 very well and thank you to everybody who has uh, joined us today i really hope you've been inspired um i can't see how you can't be so you you you're a bit hard to please if, if you haven't with our, our our wonderful speakers today uh and i really want to invite you to come on this journey with us to promote uh, gender equity and greater opportunity for refugee women and girls and indeed for the whole community who's going to be uh, a part of that all, all all the women and our families who who will join together for this as i've said i've been privileged to meet so many inspirational women through my work with australia for unhcr and now with the the leading women fund i just love these opportunities without sort of this this initiative i would never have met carolyn and aman or indeed uh, perhaps um, janine so who knows who we all might meet um if, if we all sign up uh and i really hope that through this initiative you'll be able to um, share these experiences too today i believe we can create a truly life change and long-lasting impact in the lives of both Australian and displaced um, women. We have space, as I'm saying, for just 50 founding members of the, of the program. Um, I think we would all be very proud if we, we were one of those uh, 50, a little, an important part of um, history here. So please keep a, an eye out for our email, which is going to land in your inbox after this uh, uh, event. Um, and we'd love you uh, to join us as a founding 50 member of the Leading Women's Fund. Uh, and in that email, there'll be more contacts if you want to find out more information and follow up um, any questions that you, you have after this event. We know when we empower women, we empower the whole community and indeed the world. And it really needs us uh, at, at, at this moment, at, at this critical time, I think, uh, on so many fronts. So uh, I, I really believe there's no better time than now to create uh, change for good. Thank you for standing with us, spending time with us. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion, a wonderful hour, and especially standing with refugee um, women and girls. Thank you so much.